All right, well, good morning. Good to see everybody here today. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be in John chapter 21. Just for the next couple of weeks, we're going to consider the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus. Now, we considered one of those last week, of course, on Easter Sunday when Jesus rose from the dead. He appeared to his disciples. You remember on one of the occasions, Jesus appeared to his disciples, the 11 that were remaining, but there were only 10 of them there. Jesus appeared and then he left and Thomas showed up. Thomas wasn't there. And the other disciples told Thomas that Jesus is alive. We saw him and Thomas said, I'm not going to believe unless I put my fingers in the, the wounds in his hands and the wound in his side. And then a week later, Thomas was with the other apostles. Jesus appeared in the room where they were gathered. And Jesus said, Thomas, come touch me. See the wounds. You remember what Thomas said? Thomas said, my Lord, my God. And Jesus said, Thomas, you believe in me because you've seen me, because you've touched me, but blessed are those who do not see me and who do not get to touch me and yet still believe. You know, Matthew chapter 28 says that there was also an appearance in Galilee. And it was on that mountain in Galilee that Jesus gave the disciples the great commission. So Jesus appeared to his disciples in two regions in Israel, in Jerusalem and also in Galilee. And these took place over a 40-day period before Jesus ascended up into heaven. So today we're going to be in John chapter 21. We're going to consider an appearance of Jesus to some of his disciples on the Sea of Galilee. So the disciples, Mary was told by Jesus to send the disciples to Galilee. They were also told that Jesus would meet them there. So they were making their way to Galilee. And a, a portion of the disciples were gathered together on this particular day. They were waiting for the sign or whatever it was to let them know where they were to meet Jesus. And they had been waiting for some time. So it's during that waiting period that we pick up in chapter 21, verse 1. It says, after these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And in this way, he showed himself. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were gathered together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, we are going to go with you also. They went out and immediately got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. So here we see one of the appearances in Galilee. So there's a group of seven disciples gathered together on the shores of Galilee, the Sea of Galilee. I would assume that they were in Capernaum. That's where Peter's house was. That's where much of Jesus' ministry took place. The passage does not say that it was seven of the apostles. It says seven of the disciples. We know that there were four apostles there that day. You know, one of the men named there was Nathaniel. He was an early follower of Christ. You remember Jesus said of Nathaniel, there is a man with no guile. But we're not told that Nathaniel was one of the apostles. You know, some people speculate that Nathaniel is one and the same with Bartholomew, who was one of the 12. They think that Bartholomew was his last name. But we really don't have confirmation of this in the scripture. The sons of Zebedee were there, James and John. And then two of the seven were unnamed. You know, what stands out to me as we consider this, is that here the disciples are. They're back in Galilee. These are their, this is their hometown. They grew up among the people in Galilee. They were known by everybody. Everybody knew them. Everybody knew also that they were disciples of Jesus. They had been going around preaching and teaching that Jesus was the Messiah and following Jesus around for over three years. And so everybody knew who the disciples of Jesus were. And now all these people who were wondering, you know, many of them, they saw the miracles of Jesus. They're wondering, and they were watching Jesus to see what was going to become of him. They all thought he was dead. Now, the disciples at this time, they knew that Jesus was alive because he'd already appeared to them, but nobody else knew that. They thought that he was a false Messiah because the Messiah should not be dead. And now his followers, his disciples, they're without a shepherd. Now, you can imagine how the people of Galilee, they were looking at them, how they kind of looked down at them. You know, many would have looked down at them. They would have been like, man, there goes those guys. They were duped. They were deceived. They thought Jesus was the Messiah, but Jesus died. 
And so you can imagine the looks that were coming their way. People were saying they sacrificed everything, their jobs, their careers, to follow a false messiah. You know, when we look at this today, though, I look at this story, and this is one of the great proofs of the resurrection. You know, the very fact that the disciples and those key apostles, that they were able to stay together through this opposition, that they were united, even in the face of those who knew them best, their own people, it's a, it's a great proof that the resurrection occurred. You can imagine how hard it would have been for them to show their faces in public after the death of Christ had they not seen Jesus risen from the dead. They would have been ashamed. But for them to stick together, and all of that with, with the same purpose, with the same passion, just a few weeks from this happening, they're back in Jerusalem. And not only that, but they're preaching to the multitudes of people in Jerusalem that Jesus Christ is alive, that they witnessed him resurrected from the dead. How else can you explain that except that Jesus was indeed risen from the dead? To me, this is one of the great proofs of our faith. How do unbelievers account for this? Why did none of the apostles and disciples run away? Why did they not go hide? Why did they change countries? It's because they saw Jesus Christ risen from the dead. That's how you explain it. Not only did they preach Jesus, but they also risked their lives for him. You know, these apostles, years later, they, almost all of them are going to die for their faith, claiming that Jesus Christ was risen from the dead. Now, on another note, we learn from this passage that it's good for the disciples of Jesus to stick together. This is how we are known. It's true today. You see, if the closest followers of Christ back then, if they had not stuck together, if they had bailed on each other, if they had scattered everywhere in hiding, the church would have never grown, it would have never spread, we wouldn't be here today. Christians are meant to be together. We are supposed to be in community together. We're supposed to be in local churches, we're supposed to be accountable to one another, you're supposed to have a pastor. All of these things are true, they come straight from God's Word. Christians are meant to be in community. Peter and these other apostles and disciples they're in Galilee waiting on Jesus the other apostles were probably on their way or waiting nearby again they all know that Jesus is alive but they still don't understand anything they're just kind of in waiting mode and then in verse 3 of our text you see Peter says Peter's always a man of action he's always you know impulsive he says I'm going fishing now, he was a fisherman. That was what he was by trade. He did that his whole life. And now all the other disciples said, you know what, we're going to go with you as well. You know, I love the setting here, though. That they were told to return to Galilee. You know, sleepy, slow Galilee. You know, it's, it's like that today as well. You know, in fact, I just went to Israel last year in May. I was in Israel. And whenever you go to Israel on a trip, the region of Galilee when compared to Jerusalem, it's like just two different trips in one. They're so radically different. When you are on the Sea of Galilee, it's like out in the country. I mean, it's open, it's beautiful. The lake is beautiful. The mountains that surround, like goes all the way around the lake, all those mountains where Jesus walked. And you wake up in the morning and you're standing, you know, you're right on the shore of Galilee and it's so quiet and peaceful. There's, no, there's only like one or two roads around there. It's just so quiet. It's literally out in the country, but it's open and beautiful. But then you transit, you go to Jerusalem and it's huge population. It's a major city and people are bustling around everywhere just like they do today. You know, think of, think of all that these men went through over the previous three years. The great crowds that followed them. They were famous. They were following Jesus everywhere. They, all these great crowds, all the, the hectic schedule all the busyness, all the miracles, all the excitement. And now here they are back in Galilee, back where they started. And it's quiet. There's nothing to do. They're just waiting. Jesus is supposed to meet them. Peter clearly is getting a little stir crazy. He says, I'm going to go fishing. And all the other apostles, they jump in the boat with him and they stay out all night and they catch absolutely nothing. All right, verse four. But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, children, do you have any food? And they answered him, no. 
And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast. Now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. I apologize right there. I'm calling this section the, 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 we are to be fishers of men. That's true. That's what Christians are supposed to be, fishers of men. Jesus, three years before, called these same fishermen. That's what they were. They were fishermen by trade. He called them to drop their nets, to drop their careers. And he said, follow me. And he said, I will make you fishers of men. You know, no one is going to catch the souls of men without the help of the Lord. Just like these seven disciples, they spend the night out on the Sea of Galilee and they catch absolutely nothing. But now the morning has come. Jesus shows up. And they fill up their nets. You know, Jesus called out to them. They weren't far from the shore. Jesus said, do you guys have any food? And they said, no. He said, cast your net on the right side of the boat. And they did. And they caught so many large fish, they could not even pull them onto the boat. You see, they had tried in their own strength all night long without success. But in the morning when Jesus came, he helped them. And he'll help us too. We just have to be patient. You know, this event, the appearance of Christ, the giving of instructions, the apostles obeying the word and the result of a huge ingathering of, of these fish, it's clearly a foreshadowing of the church in the church age. This is what the churches are. We're like nets. We're to draw in people from the world to the truth so that they can know Jesus. God calls the church to be fishers of men. We're to let down our nets, draw people in. But if we do it without Christ being present, or if we do it in a way that he does not command us or in a way that does not honor him, we're not going to catch anything. But if we'll be in his presence, if we'll hear his voice through his word, if we'll just do what he tells us to do, that's when the miracles happen. That's when souls will be saved. That's when our church will grow and thrive. We have to stand on his word. We're to be fishers of men. And may the Lord show us where it is that we need to cast our net and really, the church is the net. You are the net. The Lord casts you out every week. We gather here on Sundays, but Jefferson Baptist Church goes out. You're cast out into the community where you are. And we're to draw that net back in. We're to be fishers of men. You know, these disciples, they take their nets, they threw it on the right side of the boat. They caught so many fish, they couldn't draw it in. Now, you can imagine their response. You know, all night, they're out there fishing, They've caught nothing, and then they cast their net on the right side of the boat. You can just imagine in your mind, they throw the net down. All seven of them are looking over the side of the boat as they start to draw it in, and they catch so many. They can't, they're struggling. So all seven of them are sitting there looking at this unbelievable amount of fish in this net. You can imagine what they did. They all, they're looking down, and then they look back to the shore. Who is? They didn't know it was Jesus. And they all look back towards the shore at this mysterious man, and that's when John, the apostle, he knew. He, did, he, he was able to, to know. He had discernment. And he said, it is the Lord. Look at verse 7. It says, therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. Now, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put, out, he put on his outer, outer garment, for he had removed it, and plunged into the sea. But the other disciples, they came, came in the little boat, for they were not far from the land, about 200 cubits, dragging the net with fish. Then as soon as they had come to the land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you have just caught. Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to the land full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not broken. Jesus said to them, come and eat breakfast. <clears throat> Yet none of the disciples dared ask him, who are, who are you? Knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them and likewise the fish. This is now the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. So the disciple that Jesus loved, that is John, John the apostle. John immediately perceived that it was the Lord. The moment that all the, those fish entered the net, he knew it. I love the differences of personalities that you see in this story. You know, the differences in reactions. John was discerning. He had discernment. He was the first to, to recognize and to um, discern that that was the Lord that was standing there on the, the shore. And he yells out, it is the Lord. Now, Peter, less discerning, far more emotional. 
The man who just reacts as soon as John helped him out and he realized that's Jesus, he just jumps out of the boat, starts making his way swimming to the land. Verse 8 says that they were only about 100 yards from the shore, so he, was, he wasn't going to drown. But he was so impulsive. You know, consider these different reactions. What it tells me, God can use all of us. We all have different strengths. We have different personalities. But when it all works together, no matter what our personalities are, there's all kinds of personalities in the church. Some are like John. They excel in discernment and knowledge. Others are like Peter, and they are big personalities, and they're impulsive, and they're always willing to work and to attempt great things for the Lord. You know, others are steady servants in the background, like Nathaniel and these other disciples in the boat. You know, they, they had their hands on the net that were filled with fish. You know, they were struggling just to keep those fish. They were trying to keep it by the boat so that they wouldn't lose them. You know, if all those disciples, if they would have had the same reaction as Peter, if they all would have just jumped out of the boat and started swimming to the shore, they would have lost all those fish. You see, God uses all the different personalities, all the different disciples. There's many gifts in the church. You know, some serve as the church's eyes. Some are the church's heart. Others are the, the church's hands. But it all works together to form the body of Christ. That's who we are. All are necessary. And they're all pleasing to the Lord. You know, Jesus loved Peter for what he did. You know, you can imagine Jesus. Peter jumps out of the boat, how that thrilled his heart. You know, he also loved John and his reaction. John says, it is the Lord. And he loved John for that. He loves us for all of our personalities. We bring joy to the heart of God. We need to see Christ in everything that we do. When we're going through our daily lives, when we're going through our trials and disappointments and even through our joys and our victories, we need to be a people to say, it is the Lord, just like John did. We need to be able to see. We have to be able to discern the presence of Christ in our lives. That's our privilege as Christians. Christ is everywhere. He's always with us. He's in everything. I don't know how people survive in this world without believing and knowing that Jesus is with them in everything that they face. How hopeless life would be. You know, maybe this is why there's so much violence. We live in a very violent age. It's a different kind of violence. There's always been violence in the world, but it's just different. There's so much violence in our cities. Maybe this is why, because people are just so without hope. They're, they're, the, the value that people put on life, in their own life even, they feel like they have no value. And it just leads to bad things. It's hopeless. This world is such a dark place. There's so many uncertainties that we all hang, have hanging over our heads every day. I don't know about you, I wouldn't be able to get out of bed if I didn't know that there was not a greater purpose, that Christ was in these things, that there's a purpose for my life, that Christ wants to use me to win people to the truth. What else would be the point? And not just believing, also, but knowing this to be true, knowing that Jesus is with me. I must be able to say, it is the Lord. Don't you see how knowing Christ, it sets you free. It gives you such hope and joy, no matter what you're facing in life. You know, Paul said, all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord to those who are called according to his purpose. There's nothing that happens in our life that is outside of God's purpose. God takes all of our experiences. He takes all of my experiences, even my mess ups and my mistakes. And he turns them to my good if I'll just give my heart to him. That's the privilege of being a child of God, to be numbered among God's elect, to be part of the chosen of God. It means he is here. We are his. And no matter where our here is, you could be on a boat on the Sea of Galilee in the middle of nowhere. You could be in a high rise downtown Baton Rouge. He is here. He's with you. He sees you. And he'll tell us what to do. He'll guide us on our journey. Not only that, but he'll show us where the fish are as well. You know, without faith and hope in Christ, this life is like a, it's a, this world, it's just a place of darkness. It's like a cesspool. But with Christ, there's light. He is the light of the world. We are the light of the world. It's a great hope and purpose. In verse 9, all the disciples, they make to the shore to join now, the now wet Peter, 
Jesus had prepared a fire with coals and told them to bring some of the fish that they had caught. Peter dragged the, the net onto land. It was filled with, with large fish. Verse 11 says, 150 large fish. Now, why the scripture, why they give the specific number? You know, people from the early church all the way through for 2,000 years have speculated. They've tried to allegorize this passage and find some symbolic meaning of the 153. And there's all kinds of, you know, interesting theories on what that might mean. But it could, I, I, I tend to think that it was literally just, it was just 153 fish. They counted because they were so amazed. And that was very valuable to them. They only ate a, a small portion. They probably sold the rest and used the money. Jesus said in verse 12, come and eat breakfast. But then something very interesting happens in verse 12. Verse 12, it's interesting. It says, none of the disciples asked him, who are you? Knowing that it was the Lord. But the way that is written there, you know something strange is going on. John had already, already said, it is the Lord. Peter had already jumped out of the boat and swam to the shore. But clearly there was something different about Jesus here. And they wanted to ask him. And I think that's what that verse 12 is saying. They wanted to ask him, is it, is it you? Even though they knew that it was Jesus, they still felt the urge to ask him. And the reason why is because Jesus is resurrected from the dead. He has the resurrected body of glory. It's otherworldly. He is otherworldly. And by the way, it's a body that we will all have one day as well. We will have a resurrection. Our bodies will die, but in the end, they'll be resurrected. Jesus was the firstborn among many brethren. We are to follow. If you're a born again believer in Christ, your body will be reconstituted, be resurrected. It will be the same, but it will be different. You know, all, all of us want to know, and I'm often asked, you know, will, will I still be me? On the other side, will I, will, will I still, will people know me or will I still know those who are closest to me? And the answer is absolutely yes. You have a personal relationship with the Lord. He's created you. You are going to be you for an eternity. And you're going to know your loved ones in heaven. Jesus shows us the way. We're going to be just like Jesus. Jesus was the same, but there was a difference. He was in a perfect resurrected body. It's unlike flesh in this world. It's otherworldly. You know, whenever Mary saw Jesus after the resurrection, you remember last week, she mistook him for being the gardener. But whenever Jesus spoke to her, that's when she recognized and she tried to cling to him. You remember the disciples on the road to Emmaus, they even ate a meal with Jesus. They didn't know it was Jesus. Yet they knew there was something different. And as time went on, as they spent the evening with him, they realized that they knew in their hearts it was Jesus. They just weren't sure. And then whenever Jesus left and left them with that word, they said, did we not feel our hearts burn within us? They knew that it was Jesus. But why did they have this doubt? It's because they were still in the flesh. They were standing in the presence of an interdimensional being, God. God, who is in another dimension, came into our dimension in the flesh. They were still in the flesh. They couldn't believe what they were seeing. See, they couldn't believe what they were seeing. It's like they had to pinch themselves. Am I dreaming this? You see, if we're not careful, and this is the danger for us today, if we're not careful, because we're in the flesh. If we love the flesh, if we love sin, if we pursue the things of the world and neglect our spiritual life, we're not going to recognize Jesus. We won't see him. If we give ourselves over to unbelief and the, sin, and the sins of this age, it's like a veil between us and the Lord. If we give ourselves over to the sins of the flesh, we don't see Christ clearly. The disciples, you see, they had to learn Christ all over again. They knew him when he was in the flesh, but now they have to learn him in a new way. And for us today, we know Christ through faith, through his revealed word. We're, we're told where we can find him and how we can have a relationship with him and grow in that relationship. And the better we know him, the closer we are, the better we know his word. The more we pray and walk in fellowship with him, the more we're going to be able to recognize him through all of our circumstances of life. And we'll be able to cry out like John did and say, it is Jesus. It is the Lord. All right, verse 15. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? 
He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Do you love me? So as soon as this breakfast was over, Jesus turns his attention to Peter. Peter, again, was, you know, one of the key leaders of the apostles. Three times he questions Peter in front of the other disciples. Peter, do you love me? Three times Peter says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. But the third time, Peter was grieved. He felt like something was wrong. He, he, was, he, he was emotional about it. Lord, you, you, you know my heart. You can look inside of me. You know that I love you. Three times Jesus says to Peter, feed my sheep. Tend my sheep. Feed my little sheep. You know, this passage is often referred to as the restoration of Peter. It's pretty obviously obvious why. You know, this is called the restoration of Peter. How many times did Peter deny Jesus? Three times. And then the rooster crowed. And here we have P Peter being questioned by Jesus three times. Jesus, or Peter, do you love me? You see, Jesus is teaching Peter and through Peter, all of us today, the most important thing as Christians that we can do, which is to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our minds, with all of our souls. To literally love him. You see, if we lack love of our Lord, we're going to lack in every other area of our life and faith. If we love the Lord just a little, we're not going to do but little for him. If our love for the Lord is just little, we're going to have little faith. If our love for the Lord is little, we're only going to be willing to sacrifice just a little for the Lord in this world when we're called on to sacrifice everything. See, love is what the Lord wants from us. You see, if our love and if our faith is great, if our love is great, our faith will be great. You know, Jesus did not ask Peter, notice this, Peter, he didn't say, Peter, are you sorry for betraying me? That's not what he asked. Him. He did not say, Peter, how many tears did you shed for betraying me? He didn't say, Peter, how much penance have you done since you betrayed me that night, that awful night? No, he didn't say that. He said, Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Now, God wants genuine love from those who follow him. Now, I understand our works are important. The things that we do are important. We're absolutely supposed to do good works for the Lord. We're born again Christians. We're supposed to walk in faith with the Lord. We're supposed to glorify his name in this world by doing good works. That's not how we have a relationship with him. Now he wants our hearts to genuinely and truly love him. You know, you might shed tears because of your sin. You might try to do a lot of good works to make sure that God is pleased with you. You might go to some church and try to do a bunch of, you know, traditions and penance or whatever it is they tell you to do. Jesus just says to you, do you love me? Now, if you love him, everything else will fall into place. If you love the Lord, you're going you're gonna to serve him. Now, Jesus reveals to Peter, it's, it's not obedience and perfection and vows that he's looking for from Peter on this occasion. What he wants is Peter's love. Peter, Jesus says, Peter, I want you to love me. I want you to know that I love you. I've forgiven you. Not only that, but you have a great purpose. Go and feed my sheep, tend my sheep. You see, if we love Jesus and our love is genuine and sincere, all else will be well. After Jesus asked him the third time, verse 17, says, Peter was grieved. He says, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. You see, P Peter knew that Jesus could read his mind and look into his heart. He can look into yours as well and into mine. He knows what's there. Do we love him? If you love him, you'll serve him. You'll follow him. You'll pray to him. You'll be hungry to grow in your relationship with him. Look what Jesus says next, verse 18. <clears throat> 
He says, most assuredly, I say to you, he's saying this to Peter, when you were younger and girded yourself and walked where you wished, but when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke signifying what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. So Jesus, he puts Peter through this questioning to restore him, to prepare him for what was to come. He reveals to him how he's going to die. It's going to be a brutal death. He's going to die for Christ. But yet Jesus says, follow me. That's why he's revealing himself through these questions. And I want you to notice very carefully, Jesus did not promise Peter. He does not promise any of his apostles, any of his disciples, health, wealth, prosperity. Do you see that in the text? He does not promise those things. We rejoice in it. We're a very prosperous age that we live in. We're a prosperous people. Not all, not all people around the world are so lucky and blessed. We're not promised prosperity. There's entire churches that are predicated and built upon this idea of health and wealth and prosperity and money. It's amazing to me how people, Christians, born-again Christians, follow that and get entrapped by that, those lies. As though Jesus has promised us health, wealth, and prosperity. That's not the case at all. In fact, he promises Peter, you're going to die a brutal death. He says, when you are old, they will stretch out your hands and they will take you to a place you do not want to go. He says, when you were younger, before you were my follower, you could dress how you wanted. You could live how you wanted. But when you're older, now that you're a follower of Christ, you follow me, they're going to stretch out your hands. Do you know how Peter died? He died by crucifixion in Rome on an upside-down cross. Eusebius, the ancient historian, tells us that he requested the upside-down cross because he didn't feel worthy to be killed like Jesus was. In fact, Eusebius tells us the story how Peter, they were taking him, going to a place he didn't want to go. And as they were taking him to the place where he was to be crucified, which, is, by the way, is where St. Peter's in Rome is today. They know where it is. That's right where it happened. Eusebius says he walked by his wife. His wife was there when he was killed. And the last thing he ever said to his wife in this world, he walked past her and he said, he said, hey, you, he said, remember the Lord. And she watched as he was crucified. Jesus said, Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Then feed my sheep, tend my sheep. Feed my sheep, because assuredly I tell you, the day is coming when you're going to be killed for your faith in me. You, they will stretch out your hands. They'll take you to a place where you do not wish to go. Follow me. That's what he says. He doesn't promise him any material things in this world. He just says, follow me. Even if it leads to your death, you follow me. He makes no other promises. It's the same word to us. That is our calling. This is the post-resurrection message of Jesus to his disciples. Love me. Follow me. Jesus in John chapter 10, he says, I'm the good shepherd. He revealed himself as the good shepherd. My sheep follow my voice. They won't follow the voice of another because they know my voice. He says, follow me. Join me in prayer. Lord Jesus, we come before you. Lord God, we thank you for your word. We give you all praise and glory for it. It is the light to our path in this dark world. God, I pray for every soul in this room today. Holy Spirit, speak to us. There are some today here that need to be followers of you. They need to answer that call. They need to surrender themselves to you. God, take this time of invitation. Your will be done in every soul. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.